So Wolfgang, we've let um, attendees in already uh, and we're live streaming and we're recording. You can start when you're ready. Okay. You can hold on to Grant. Yeah, is it still filling up slowly by slowly? We had many more registered, but they're not yet entering. Maybe we could give us another four minutes before we start if uh, that makes the room a little bit fuller. Yeah, the number is still growing. Yeah, it's so still going wait up. until 15.05. Okay. All right. I realize um, Yeah, I think we're good to go. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. We are very happy to have you all in this webinar on research dissemination, harnessing education technology as a response to COVID-19 in seven African countries. Uh, it takes place today on Africa Day. We thought that is an appropriate moment to have this topic launched. Before I take you through the agenda, I wanted to uh, give an opportunity to the global coordinator, Grant Kasawanjete, to welcome you all and open the meeting. Over to you, Grant. Thank you so much, uh, Wolfgang, and greetings uh, to you all, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, you know, depending on where you are. We just want to welcome you to this important uh, webinar where we will be disseminating the scoping study that we conducted. And I think today is even more important because today is the Africa Day. So it is a day that actually culminates very well with what we are undertaking. The question that I've always been asking myself is that when you look at you know, the continent or in, in, in the world, Africa is the most resourced one, but yet Africa still lags behind in development. There's so much poverty in Africa. 
And one question is why is that the case? And in, in most cases, there are various reasons that are given, corruption, maladministration, and lots of things. But the most important thing, which I feel is very important and which actually links to what we're doing today is the lack of technology in Africa, that Africa has not fully embraced you know, the power of technology, be it in education, be it in health, be it in every sector of the economy that you know, or, um, Africa plays in. And I think it is very important that you know, Africa, if we, Africa wants to be part you know, of, of the broader development that is happening in the world, that you know, Africa should embrace education. And more so for us, who are within the education sector. You know, we, COVID has taught us that we cannot just rely on the normal traditional ways of teaching, of learning, you know, of actually imparting knowledge or wisdom to any learner. We need to find other ways of doing it. And I think you know, there are various good studies that have been done in the seven countries that you know, we have been working on, where they are beginning to champion new ways of thinking, new ways of working. And I think we're going to hear from the researchers themselves on what they were able to find on this. From the GCE standpoint, you know, we are saying to all of these processes are important. Technology has to be the center of it all, but we have to ensure that no one is left behind. The challenge we have in Africa is that there is no infrastructure. In many countries, they don't have what it takes for them to be able to provide online learning. When COVID struck, we all heard everyone talking about online learning, but little or no studies or even maybe few were done to really do an assessment of what you know, technological infrastructure does exist in these countries. And I think the scoping study that has been done reveals all of this. And I believe that through this discussion today, we are going to learn more. And this should empower us as civil society to really have something in our hands to advocate within our government. What I normally see now is that there has to be a proper coordination between private sector, public sector, civil society, and all of us, so that you know, we are able to deliver the right education uh, to our learners. Gone are the days when everything else has to rely on the, um, the normal traditional ways of learning. We Africa should embrace the new ways of learning, and we have to digitalize most of the processes that we have. If through that, we are going to reach out to more. And we are very much thankful to GIZ for the support that they provided and continue to provide to the GCA movement for us to be able to undertake this and to even the researchers and everyone else who contributed to this work. So I welcome you to this event. Please feel free to participate. This is our event. It is for all of us. And it will be very important for us to engage and be able to deliberate and debate on the issues that you know our researchers have been able to and aid from the work that I've done. So thank you so much and over to you, Mufta. Okay, thank you, Grant, for this welcoming address. Uh, I will quickly take you to the agenda. So we will uh, first uh, invite Iris Grobensky from Backup Education GIZ to give us a little bit of the background when was this whole programmatic idea of digital bridges created and how, uh, where did the funding come from, etc. All of that uh, is something it would be interesting to know more about that. And it's indeed out of that program that we when we uh, were then uh, sort of invited to also submit a proposal like uh, some countries uh, in Africa, according to a selection uh, within the GIZ that led to uh, eight proposals now being prepared. Some of them have already been approved. Most of them, two are still outstanding. Uh, and we will certainly have more uh, webinars of this type, more learning exchange to hear about the sort of impact or the outcome of these particular uh, pilot programs, as we may call them. After Iris, we will then invite the researchers themselves, Dr. Rhonda Zelezny Green and Hannah Metcalf, uh, to present the study and what we can draw of it. 
We will also have uh, an occasion to listen to Gita Gambir and Juliet Cotonia, who work for the National Foundation for Educational Research in UK. They had given us the very appreciated uh, opportunity to do a peer review, a pro bono. That was a fantastic uh, sort of contribution to the process. And then we'll go after a break into listening to where uh, some of our colleagues who have been uh, funded and have the uh, opportunity of uh, working with under the management of, G, of GCE to uh, implement their own proposed programs in Namibia. That is going to be Martin Matsui from the National uh, from NEXO, uh, the national, the Namibian, uh, I, I have to check up the, the abbreviation, it's not a normal coalition, uh, but um, uh, represents civil society in Namibia. And then we have Bafashi Bige from Burundi, that's Denise Kandondo, their uh, coalition is called Bafashi Bige, that's the national Education Coalition in Burundi, who will talk about her experiences. And last not least, we have Benedicto Kondowe, who will present the case of Malawi. After these very practical sort of um, presentations of what is happening in those three countries from civil society piloting, uh, we will go into a question and answer session, and that will be moderated by Luis Eduardo Perez Murcia, who is the GCE Policy and Research Advisor, will give us 20 minutes, and then we'll see what the takeaways might be at the end of uh, two hours sort of learning together. So I hope we'll all take something uh, back home out of this uh, meeting and we will be very happy to sort of see your questions coming through uh, either you have posed them already beforehand or you put them into the chat uh, i don't know whether uh, salma you still want to do some house um, keeping rules regarding interpretation or is that all sorted um, okay, so welcome colleagues. We just would like to let you know we have interpretation available in French. You can click on the globe below and you'll be able to choose your language. Thank you. Okay, that's all. That's a very straightforward, not a very complicated uh, logistics arrangement for today. So without any further ado, I would then want to invite Iris Grobensky from Backup Education Initiative uh, and a part of the GIZ uh, program. Over to you, Iris, and welcome. Thank you, Wolfgang, <clears throat> and welcome to everyone. Um, yes, welcome from the side of the um, German Backup Initiative. We are a GIZ project and we are part of a bigger um, action by the European Union called Resicodi, um, which means resilience to COVID-19 through digitalization. So um, this EU action is jointly implemented by GIZ, by us, but also by the Belgium Development um, Agency, Annabelle, in a Team Europe approach. And I will give um, a quick overview of this action and what we are doing in the backup initiative. So yeah, um, as a framework for this action. So of course, you all know that uh, when um, COVID-19 struck in um, spring of 2020, um, there was a um, disruption in education all over the world. So schools closed in 191 countries in April 2020. And um, many countries, um, use digital solutions as a means to continue education and uh, to prevent the disruption of schooling. But um, also most of the countries face several challenges um, when using digital solutions. So um, there's still a lack of internet access in many countries. 
there is still a lack of um, access to hardware that can be used for educational purposes. And we also face limited digital skills of teachers, but also of students. And in many countries, there's a strong digital divide between urban and rural areas, especially when it comes to access um, to hardware, to access um, to connectivity issues. So <clears throat> um, we also have a digital divide between genders and where women still have less access to computers and still are less able to use computers. Uh, so this is um, the situation uh, that we all faced and the EU, um, uh, the EU, um, sorry, the EU announced <laughs> a global um, COVID-19 response because of, because of uh, this situation and um, the Resicodi action is part of this global response. So it's, it's an action co-funded by the European Union and the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. And as I said, it's jointly implemented by Annabelle and by us, GIZ, in a Team Europe approach. And the original implementation period was November 2020 to October um, this year. But we are currently in the process of getting a prolongation until October next year. So yeah, to give you um, more of an overview of what this action entails. So um, the action is working uh, in different sectors. So we as GIZ are working in the education um, sector, basic education. Um, so we are contributing to the specific objective one, digital solutions to improve quality and continuation of education services. And um, Annabelle is uh, working in the TVET sector and the health sector. So you can see that this action really um, tackles um, the issues in very essential basic sectors that were most um, affected by the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we also have a joint objective, uh, which is very um, important for us. It's supporting networks between partner countries and sectors. So um, we in the backup initiative, we um, see digitalization as a big transformation process, a process that really um, spans the whole society and that encompasses all, all subsectors. And even if you just look at one sector, the digital education sector, um, of course, you can see that um, digitalization is important for every aspect of the sector. So if we ask ourselves, what do we need to foster a high-performing digital education system? We see that um, we need lots of different things like connectivity, we need planning capacities for digital solutions, we need organizational capacities, we need digitally competent teachers, we need quality content in digital format, we need user-friendly and intuitive tools, and we need secure platforms which also touches upon the important topic of um, data protection. So um, that is why we in the backup initiative, um, we are working as a fund and we decided to really um, view digitalization as a very broad um, topic and, and see it in a very broad perspective. So our philosophy is that we are a demand-based fund and our partners that are ministries of education, ministries of ICT and civil society coalitions or civil society organizations from our eight partner countries that you can see in this um, blue box here, they can apply to us. And um, as I said, we really uh, want to be demand-based. So um, our philosophy is that uh, we really want to see what's going on on the ground. What are the needs of the partners, the needs of the countries? Um, do they need more low-tech approaches or more high-tech? And that's why we are um, funding a broad range of activities um, in our initiative, ranging from using phone calls, using SMS for bridging school closures or um, installing solar panels for radio um, listening clubs or um, yeah, up to really developing digital content to include it in the curriculum and um, also to implement teacher training and digital skills. 
And besides the um, activities that will be presented later that um, are financed by us, I brought some other examples um, for you. So um, the Ministry of Education in Zambia is planning to implement teacher training on digital content development and the use of ICT. So it's not ongoing yet. The application is, um, is in the contract department and we hope that we can start it soon. And also in Zambia, the National Education Coalition is already implementing a blended learning system using radio lessons, but also online platforms. And uh, we also finance activities for an individual NGO in Botswana. They do team challenges that require digital skills for children and young people um, in communication and organization. So, um, and of course, as Wolfgang already mentioned, um, the study done by GCE is um, also one activity financed by our fund. And yes, we are um, very curious to hear more about the results of the study later. So for those of you who don't know the backup initiative, mm -hmm. we use an approach um, made up of, of three pillars. So, we offer technical and financial advice to um, the applicants. Then we offer financial support. So for each application, usually it's approximately 100,000 euros. And um, we offer networking support um, to really give the partners a chance to learn from each other and exchange experiences. And when it comes to the technical advice, we are partnering up with other international organizations and initiatives like UNESCO, UNICEF, um, Oxfam, and so on, in a so-called quality check, because for us, it's really important to see if the proposed activities by the partners are really um, embedded in the local education policies and strategies, and um, that they really um, do fit to what the other donors are doing on the ground. And we also encourage um, our applicants to cooperate with the private sector, depending, of course, on the proposed activities, but especially when it comes to connectivity or lack of digital infrastructure, you need the private sector um, on board. And as also Grant mentioned in the beginning, it's very important um, to bring the public and private sector and civil society together to find um, sustainable solutions for digitalization and education. So um, yeah, coming, coming to the topic of today, the research study for us, it's um, yeah, research and data collection is really important because as I said, for us, it's important to see the situation on the ground in the countries. So it's essential that we know what is the status quo, what are good practices that exist already, what are tools that are already being used and tested and yeah, these facts and figures are the basis for policy planning, um, for informed decision-making, for future projects um, also from our side. So we're very happy to hear more about that later. And to conclude, I just want to give you a short preview about something that um, GIZ is planning to do. So it's not official yet, but GIZ plans to launch a new project um, called Generation Digital, and it will concentrate on the topic of digital skills for children and youth in Africa. It will work mostly on the structural level. So the goal is to strengthen education actors in selected African partner countries regarding the promotion of digital competencies of children and youth. And um, right now it is planned that the setup of the project is looking very similar to the setup we have now in the backup initiative. So and most likely there will also be a fund where people can apply um, to, and there will also be a component for regional exchange. So yeah, we will keep, um, keep you posted and hope we can work together under the new project in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Iris, for this succinct uh, overview of what uh, GIZ has intended together with Inabel and with funds from the EU. That's fantastic. And it's also good to hear that there will be a continuation uh, more uh, drifting towards youth and children. 
as uh, users of uh, digitalization. Great. I think we'll come back to some questioning later, but we would now want to uh, really sort of go into the heart of the study and uh, invite uh, Rhonda and Hannah to uh, tell us what the outcome and the results of the study, the scoping study were and how we can make use of them. So I guess it's Rhonda who's gonna take the floor. Over to you, Rhonda, and thank you very much for uh, sterling work that you have uh, given to us. And I think it's really worth the while. I mean, I, I should just say that to colleagues that we are still busy working on a, uh, a layouted version of the full report, uh, then it will be made accessible and published over the GCE channels. But we will also produce a 20, 25 pages shorter version with the more central sort of uh, statements and results of that study. But because we want to share that as widely as possible, that will be out possibly in July. Over to you now, Rhonda. We are very eager to hear you. And Great, you know, and I have a question. Uh, are there, is there Q and A right after this or how is it working? That wasn't indicated in the schedule. No, the Q and A is after we had uh, the. We will have the NFER bit, and then listen to the three country studies, and then we'll uh, allow for all subject areas to be dealt with under the Q and A at the nearly the end of our meeting. Okay, because there's one challenge. I, I actually have a meeting at 5 p.m. So when I saw the schedule, I was like, oop, that might be uh, a problem. And I'm in the same time zone as you for reference. So just a heads up on that. I thought it would be right after. <laughs> All right. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, and and uh, nodding to Wolfgang with what he said as well with uh, Happy Africa Day. Um, I am based, uh, I'm a researcher based in Spain, uh, though obviously African roots, so very happy to be celebrating this day with you. Uh, my name is Dr. Rhonda Jelesny green uh, and I'm an expert in education, technology, and gender, among other things, and I'm joined by my colleague, Ms. Hannah uh, Metcalf, who is usually based in Tanzania, but is um, back in the UK for a short visit, um, though I will leave today's presentation. I have 20 minutes, so uh, maybe not everything will be covered, but I'm sure GCE will be working to release the report in due course. But this was something that for me as a researcher was awesome to be involved in, not only because it's something very current, um, but just also it is something that I'm, you know, particularly passionate about, not only as a, a mother myself, but also as someone who uses ed tech for, for her own education. So I'm glad to be here with you and, and look forward to, to going through the results with you. So uh, before we get started, I, I'd like to say that the work um, that was undertaken for the research study um, was very much informed by a, a now former GCE employee, uh, Ashanti, who really encouraged us to make sure that not only were we applying decolonial perspectives to this work, um, but that also that we were taking an intersectional approach. So in doing this, making sure that things are decolonial and also that they are intersectional, um, when Hannah and I were reflecting on, on the report and our responses and, and how everything came together, you'll notice that a lot of the things that we say are not very common when you look at ed tech literature or education literature more broadly, because we took the, the road of being you know, very honest about what was going on, but then also using both the decolonial and intersectional lenses helped us in the analysis to surface things that, that are not very typical. So the report itself will be an interesting read. 
Um, the data collection uh, for the report essentially occurred over a six week period um, occurring between October and December of 2021. So this was something we were hard at work over as our Christmas gift to the GCE coalition. Um, and during this period, we did a combination of activities to, to gather data that would be later analyzed. Um, the first thing that we did um, was to conduct uh, key informant interviews, possibly with some of the people that are, that are on the call with us. Um, and these were about 30 minute interviews where we asked a set of questions about the situation on the ground during the pandemic, particularly in, in, in 2020. Um, apart from the key informant interviews, we also um, uh, executed a, a survey where we sent out um, a, a survey not only to the GCE coalition, but also to people on the continent um, and our, our network that would have some knowledge about EdTech in Africa uh, during the pandemic. Um, we also conducted what was called a continental literature review, so focusing specifically on sub-Saharan Africa, because obviously the pandemic affected every country in the world, and to make sure that we narrowed it to be as relevant as possible to this study, um, we focus on, on sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly looking at journals, research reports, and so forth. As you might imagine, given the long time it takes to get uh, a journal article published, we don't actually reference that much academic literature in the report. So the report itself is super accessible, um, but that's because during this stuff happened during the pandemic and stuff is, is still, academic literature is still coming out about that. So you'll see a lot of, um, you know, white papers and things of that nature for that reason. Um, so what we really focused on in this study is making sure um, we knew from the perspective of the people who were there, how, if at all, effective ed tech was during the pandemic and what are those things that occurred during the pandemic that we could actually use and, and scale up or to do again. As many of you know, the pandemic is not the only time that school closures happen, not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but around the world. But in terms of how educational continuity is maintained, we know that this period during the pandemic, this unprecedented time, was one of the only times that we actually saw governments turn to ed tech en masse to try to make sure educational continuity was continued because moving around was not safe. In some cases, it's still not safe because people are still being infected with the virus and so forth. So that was our aim to really see what lessons learned could come out of this. And of course, to see um, what things we should be avoiding um, in the future as we try to, um, to take these things forward. So um, in terms of the, the school closures that, that happened during the pandemic, as you can see on screen, depending on the country, uh, things were, were very varied. Um, the people that we talked to, as well as cross-referencing what people said to us with what we, we found online from news articles that, that announced that schools were being closed, um, we knew that over 1.5 billion learners globally were affected. And so, of course, that means millions and millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa um, as well. For all of the countries that we investigated, all of them except for Burundi um, closed uh, during this period. And, and you can read more of that outside of the report if, if you want to know why that happened. Um, and most of the schools um, were closing um, and, and implementing things like lockdown, social distancing, mask wearing, and things of that nature. Um, and because of these closures, we know that learners were sometimes put in, you know, in, in situations where you know, the only way that they could learn was through whatever the government provided in the form of distance education. One notable exception that was mentioned across several of our, our key informant interviews is the fact that if you were one, a student in any of these seven countries and you were attending a private school, boy, were you lucky because the, the experiences that people recounted, it, it seemed like if you were in a private school, there was almost no interruption to your education whatsoever because the pivot to digital learning through ed education technologies was almost seamless. But of course, we know this was not the case um, in, in, in uh, public schools. 
So in terms of some of the key themes that emerged from the study, um, we know that one of the things that was not often talked about, but that did emerge uh, a lot in the study was the impact that the, the pandemic had on children themselves. So one thing that was not talked about was the effect of mental health uh, in terms of the pandemic. So for example, suddenly not going to school anymore, not seeing your friends. And in some cases, particularly for girls, being in a home life situation where you were more exposed to, to harm simply because school in, in, in many senses was a refuge. So having that taken away, of course, you know, had a, a severe impact on children's mental health. Um, another thing related to that, of course, is uh, related to safeguarding, particularly of, of girls who would be attending school. Um, we had several people mention that some girls were, were married off early um, or found themselves um, pregnant as a result of things that happened when they were forced to be at home during the school closures. Um, we also saw as a broad theme that if you were a disabled child, you pretty much were out of luck in terms of being able to take advantage of any of the approaches that that governments use. Though this is not unique to Sub-Saharan Africa, because I think the only country that we came across in our research that had an active program looking at people with disabilities and how to keep them learning and online was actually in Bangladesh. So this, this is something that we know that children with disabilities are already marginalized wherever they're found in the world. So this was you know, doubly compounded with, with the pandemic. Um, then we also saw, and this is something that as well was not really talked about, that when the pandemic happened, it not only affected schools, but also people who were working. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in many cases, that meant work stopped altogether for parents so that when it was time to even restart schools or to try to participate in digital learning, a lot of parents were not actually able to afford being able to send their children to school due to the income loss from the pandemic. So the pandemic was such a one-two punch um, in terms of really affecting people, their livelihoods, their schooling. And one study that I saw um, from UNESCO uh, I think it was UNESCO, UNICEF, and the World Bank estimated that the amount of learning loss that occurred during the pandemic worldwide is likely to translate to $17.6 trillion that is lost in future earning potential because of the children who were out of school, $17.6 trillion. So we know that this is a serious. serious. Um, we know that we need to do better. We need to get it right for the next time something like this happens and affects schools. So, so that's what we'll be covering. Um, in terms of the solutions that were adopted during the school closures, one of the things that was very, very exciting to see as an ed tech researcher is that the approach to um, the school closures in the majority of the countries was not one that just said, hey, let's do tech first. Tech is the only thing we can go to. In fact, the vast majority of countries adopted a multimodal approach, meaning that they use multiple different types of ways to conduct distance-based education to help make things happen. So on the screen, you see the TV, you see the radio, you see the mobile phones. We could have also put a computer there, um, but there was also paper-based um, through, through books. So for example, I know from some of the, the people that we spoke to in the, in the different countries involved in this study, we learned that teachers were hard at work producing materials en masse by hand on paper to then have people come and pick them up from the school once they were completed. So the main technologies that we saw used across the, the seven countries were actually TV and radio. Um, and again, this was because, you know, the, the distribution, the reach was, was quite wide. In fact, um, in one country, I, I forget which, um, their UNICEF had access to radio waves that covered the entire country. So we're able to broadcast that that way. Um, a number of governments also worked up to, to set up their own online platforms to help facilitate um, educational continuity during this, this particular period. The countries that did this that we saw were Rwanda, Zambia, 
Malawi, and Namibia as some examples. Um, another thing that kind of emerged as a trend um, were the, was that SMS uh, and, and messaging by mobile phones were adopted across several countries, but this was primarily used in the same way it was before the pandemic for alerts and messaging. So in a number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa before the pandemic, alerts, messaging, reminders were already used by mobile phones. And so that simply continued and you did not actually see much of this learning happening through mobile phones with one exception, which might actually surprise you, WhatsApp. So what we did here and what we also saw reported on by other researchers was that WhatsApp, when it came to the mobile phone, this was the way that teachers were kind of communicating with parent groups. If there were students that, had, that have mobile phones and have WhatsApp, they were also using that to form peer learning groups and doing studies. So the mobile phone in this case was not at all completely irrelevant, but the purposes that it was used for were was unexpected. And this is one of the things that, you know, we think should be taken forward in the future. I think, you know, from my studies um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and my PhD experiences in Kenya, I know that the orientation to most people in Sub-Saharan Africa is mobile phones are bad. You can't do anything with them, but sex, porn, you know, whatever. And it's like, no, there are actual lots of, of, of peer groups, um, uh, how would you call it, communities of practice as well, um, that, that could be taken forward. <clears throat> so in terms of how we viewed everything um, in terms of the outcomes of, of the role and potential of technology, um, we saw that the impact itself was actually incredibly limited. Um, and this was sad, this broke my heart as an ed tech researcher because all of the work I've been doing in the past decade, when the pandemic happened, it went out the window. No one seemed to, to, to follow this advice that myself and many of other researchers have, have been doing. In fact, not only was ed tech not really used so much, where it was used, we saw that it was not well managed. So some of the people we talked to um, discussed like, oh yeah, I heard about this program, but I don't think this radio program actually meant, reached many people. Or, oh yeah, they had this stuff on TV, um, but not everyone has a TV and it was never known when that particular educational programming was gonna be shown. So all of these things meant that while there was potential to reach millions, and, and certainly we saw lots of reports from a lot of um, organizations based in high income countries that highlighted the fact that, oh yes, our, our program Program has you know had the potential to reach millions of learners. The reality on the ground was quite different. That it was almost like a lottery to to be able to access some of these solutions or to even be aware of them. So the coordination, um, the outreach around these different multimodal um, approaches needed to be um, much better uh, managed. Um, then also there was a lack of syntropic distance learning. Hannah, do you want to speak about that? You added that there, and I'm not sure that was one of the main points. Um, yes, give me one sec. I'm just going to pull it up. Yeah, I think this is exactly what we were you were just talking um, about, Rhonda, is the fact that it was very um, selective and limited whether you had access to digital services. And when those digital solutions were being created or implemented, there wasn't perhaps a central concern or um, overview of whether people could actually access those services. So for example, in a lot of the countries we spoke to, there was um, an effort by the governments and the ministries of education to offer an online platform but then the means in which they could access those um, online services was incredibly limited so um, I think it meant you know there was a consideration that people might have access to phones and they might even be able to have access to the internet but then the possibility of them being able to afford these services or for them to be zero rated that meant that everybody could um, access them wasn't necessarily um, successful or, or effectively implemented. 
Great, thank you, Hannah. And, and to build on, on what Hannah just added, um, in terms of, of access to technologies um, and, and the ability to, to use them, um, one point that emerged um, was that we also saw that the private sector support was actually minimal. So typically before the pandemic, um, a lot of mobile telecommunications or, or fixed line telecommunication providers, um, you know, often, you know, at specials offer zero rating, one-off, you know, one-off opportunities to access educational websites or even, you know, the Facebook zero type style thing where there's a wall garden of free content that people can access. So um, whereas you see a lot of press and, and, and pomp and circumstance around the private sector, Sector. What we saw was that they really came up short. Um, so I have worked both in the mobile and the internet industry, and we know, or I know, that during this period, of course, because everyone had to go online, um, mobile operators, mobile te telecommunications providers more broadly racked up the money during this period, but that did not translate to being able to, to give back to the countries in which they operate. So that was another key theme to emerge is that private sector support was minimal. This was a common theme across all of the countries. Um, I also mentioned earlier that a lot of the participants were not fully aware of all the, the interventions that were happening. Um, and this is uh, surprising for us simply because Many of you work in the education sector, so it would, you know, thereby be an assumption that, of course, if you work in education, you would hear about a lot of these interventions that people talked about, but many of them were not aware of these. So, and in the case of Burundi, of course, they didn't have a lockdown anyway. Um, so, so that was also something else that that uh, came into consideration. Um, another thing uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, was about the effectiveness of, of WhatsApp, um, but that a lot of people were also very, very frustrated with EdTech because of the perceived lack of ineffectiveness. Now, why was there a perceived lack of ineffectiveness? One thing that kept coming back again and again and again, parents and teachers, parents and teachers, parents and teachers. Many teachers, you know, undergo regular training and professional development, but for some of the stakeholders that we talked to in the key informant interviews, we do know that teachers are not always being given the time to be trained on digital technologies. And of course, when the pandemic happened, the government was trying to keep itself and its citizenry above water. And that meant that they were also doing a lot to respond to that and not actually supporting teachers with any kind of distance-based education delivery. So with that, you had uh, parents and teachers, teachers who were then cut off from their students, parents who then became teachers, and no one had the had any idea or training or skill set to be able to make advantage of the education technologies that were available if they were uh, were aware of them. So that was another thing. Um, infrastructure, uh, as most of you probably know, is a perennial issue uh, on the continent. So a lot of the people that we talked to, of course, were in were in capital cities, but a ton of them mentioned. When you're outside of the capital city, it's very much good luck. So uh, recalling from one of the interviews I con conducted in Madagascar and, and having uh, served as a teacher in Madagascar myself, we knew that when schools closed there, there were children who lived miles and miles and miles away from the school. So when they were called to come get paper-based materials, it literally was, okay, I'm, I would need to walk miles there and miles back you know, every day or every week to be able to get this. And if you're a parent, you're out of work, you suddenly see you have a new employee there because your child is not going to school. So these infrastructure issues um, appeared in, in various different ways and don't always necessarily involve having access to technology. But the reality is all of these things come together and, and are a confluence of infrastructural barriers that made participation and um, adoption of ed tech uh, a challenge. I already mentioned about the, the low literacy of the teachers and of course also the parents. Um, and I definitely say that as a teacher, not from like bad teacher, but like bad government, we need to support teachers more because they're the backbone of society. Um, and then probably the most glaring challenge was that like every other country in the world, 
most of the countries that we talked with were completely unprepared for what the pandemic meant in terms of ed tech. Of course, countries like Rwanda were, were a bit more advanced than others in terms of having this uh, technological mindset and, and being able to, to adapt to the, the new normal, as, as we now call it. Um, but that is not the case across the board. So this is one thing that I have been expounding, not only in my consulting work with GCE, but with other stakeholders, Governments have to do better. Educational continuity was not only disrupted with the pandemic. We know that if you're um, experiencing war, if you're in a refugee camp, if you are a girl and you have your period, um, if you are disabled, there are several reasons why you may miss school during the school year. So the fact that the government had no plan to, the governments had no plan to maintain educational continuity um, was such a shame and a missed opportunity. So. Um, this, this lack of planning, this lack of preparation is something that we really hope um, government stakeholders will address in the future because obviously that $17.6 trillion, it's expensive to not do anything. So um, moving forward, um, we, we recommend in terms of what things need to be done. Uh, of course, connectivity. And when I say connectivity, I don't just mean connectivity full stop, but meaningful connectivity, which the Alliance for Affordable and Internet defines as not only having the connectivity, the connection, but having the device um, and being able to afford using it, because what good is having you know, connectivity, but you don't have any device to get online with it. So making sure that there is meaningful connectivity. Um, we also oddly have to encourage the private sector of big tech to be more involved. We obviously do not want there to be an over-commercialization of the education sector, but Without a doubt, in situations like this where schooling cannot continue, there needs to be more support from experts in ed tech to be able to help other people, teachers, parents, learners, governments understand how to be able to take advantage of the opportunities afforded by ed tech and its devices. Um, we also say that ed tech can't become a vanity project. I think prior to now, there was not well, there were several practical use cases for ed tech, but this was one where it was really like, we really need to try this. And so we want to make sure that moving forward, when ed tech projects are conceived, they're not just done to be like, oh, look, you know, we have our shiny new device and, you know, people are using it. We know that ed tech can be effective in certain scenarios. And in this case would have been completely useful, but make sure that we're not just making it a vanity thing. Um, another thing um, in terms of reimagining education, this goes back to what I was saying just earlier about governments and how they did not do anything really to prepare for this. And even after the pandemic was sat with us for a while, we still saw lots of slow movement, inaction, um, and almost giving up in terms of, of supporting um, our children across the continent. So when we say to reimagine educational continuity, Ed tech should be involved, but it should be involved not just when there's a pandemic. It needs to be involved for all of those other situations that I mentioned earlier that might cause children to be able to to not be able to attend school. Um, and apart from that, um, as I opened about the, the impact on children's mental health and so forth, um, we also need to think about during these periods where we can't be together and learning, how can we provide that psychosocial uh, support to our learners to keep them strong, to keep them happy, and not just the learners, probably the teachers as, as well were suffering, um, not being able to, to practice their craft and to be around their learners. Um, and then finally, you know, as a teacher, make teachers important. Um, we, it was, as I said, a shame to hear such, um, you know, not good reports from the teachers that we talked to. So making sure that they're prioritized and supported in the ways that they need to be um, so that when another situation like this occurs, because um, we know it will, uh, look, the pandemic is still happening, right? So um, making sure that teachers and, and parents have all the support they need to help make things happen. So I'll pause there. I've gone over by six minutes, so I hope that's okay on the GCE side. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Rhonda and Hannah, for this very lively presentation 
of uh, what you have learned and what we've seen happening in at least seven countries in Africa. Uh, we had uh, at the time when we were uh, asking for expression of interest to sort of do this study, we also had uh, uh, contacts with the National Foundation for Educational Research and uh, somehow their uh, proposal did not go through or our selection criteria sort of uh, uh, did not make them the successful applicants. But th then NFER came back to us and said, oh, we're so interested in the subject. Can we do, can we offer a pro bono uh, peer review of the study when it is done? And we were happy, of course, to uh, sort of invite NFER to do that and really grateful for the work that they have done. So I would now like to invite uh, Gita and uh, Juliet to give us a little bit the uh, input on how that peer review was done and how you uh, sort of, what, what were the findings of your peer review that led to uh, a, a final version, which is still being sort of processed in on our side. Over to you, Gita or Juliet. Uh, thanks very much, Wolfgang, and also a big thanks to Rhonda um, for, and to Hannah for the overview of um, the very interesting study. So, yeah, um, my colleague Juliet will um, just outline um, our role in the review process in, 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 in a minute. But what I'll do first, um, so for myself, Gita, and um, from Juliet from the Centre for International Education, uh, thanks, Julia. If you could just go to the next um, slide. I'll just give you a quick overview of our organisation. Um, we're based in the UK, um, National Foundation for Educational Research. Um, at, at the core of what we do is really just um, research, um, evaluation and, and assessment. And it's really just to inform um, at the system level, so governments and also at the local level, school level, um, just to just to generate the best evidence, really um, most rigorous evidence to help help all of those stakeholders make uh, good decisions about uh, future funding, future policy, etc. Um, within our centre, which is the Centre for International Education, which is where Julia and I are based, um, we have um, a sub-Saharan Africa um, first focus. Um, and that is really based around um, our key countries, which are, I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, so they're a, a, experience is in these countries. So we have a research experience in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Botswana and Sierra Leone. Um, but we we have uh, we're, we're open to, to research in, in any sub-Saharan countries and, and, and further afield as well. Um, we have very particular expertise in measurement of learning outcomes. Um, so that includes um, big OECD studies. Um, so we deliver PEARLS, PISA and TIMS in the UK. Uh, we develop national assessments for governments, both in middle and low income countries. Um, and that also involves at the system level advising on the sustainable development goals. Um, some of our themes um, are in the Centre uh, for International Education and in our Centre for Assessment as well um, do converge on, on the GEC um, scoping study paper that we've, we've just heard about from colleagues. So uh, some of the themes that really converge are equity and inclusion. Um, we did a big um, endline evaluation um, of, a, of the Girls' Education Challenge um, project, which is funded by FCDO in the UK that was in Sierra Leone. Um, we have an EdTech project as well. Uh, we're looking at the kind of efficacy of um, EdTech interventions in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that's really just to kind of understand more um, access, but also um, how, how, how effective these, these interventions are. Um, and that will also um, Eventually, that will when when we finish that study, that will inform um, governments on on policy and and how to measure learning outcomes as well. 
how effective edtech is in measuring learning outcomes. Um, and uh, probably about a year ago, I think we finished um, the Civil Society Education Fund 3 um, evaluation, which of course anyone who follows GEC will be aware of. Um, just got some uh, of our funders and our partners on the right of that slide as well. So I'll now pass over to Juliet for an overview of the peer review process. Thank you, Gita. And um, I'm happy to take us through this. And so the, this is just a summary of what the review process took, um, what, what went through the process. So uh, the National Foundation for Education Research um, uh, conducted the external peer review. Uh, and it, it was the second of the review processes that were undertaken. Uh, internally, the, the study went through a review process that was uh, undertaken by um, GCE personnel that, um, that have a background and expertise in um, radical black feminist education, um, as well as international development expertise. Um, and once we had completed the uh, external review process that was in February of this year, then um, the, the final part of the review process was undertaken once again by the internal GCE secretariat staff. So uh, what did it look like? Um, we, you know, just not to get so much into the details, we, um, you know, were really um, observant, we, to, we, you know, we took note of the, the framing and the lens that was undertaken by the authors. We assessed the dis study design and the methodology. Um, we posed some questions about whether the findings were put into context of the, the literature that exists um, about the topic. And we looked into the structure itself and provided some input to the authors for, um, with regards to the conclusions and consistence with the the overall aims uh, of, uh, of the study that had been agreed with GCE and also uh, raised some questions about uh, the significance uh, of the study um, uh, with, with particular interest in um, what it means uh, and the so what about um, edtech and digital solutions within the public education settings. Um, Gita, could you please uh, share some observations? You're on mute, Gita. Apologies. Yeah, just not doing my mute there. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Juliet. Yeah, so just some observations. These are just some of the interesting kind of points. I mean, there were many within the report um, that we honed in on um, and that are obviously already kind of mentioned some of these, but they are, it's always good to reinforce. Um, it's so important, all of these points. Uh, so I'll just have a quick run through. Um, so some of the data from study uh, obviously pointed towards teacher professional development approaches um, when it comes to teachers um, being presented with ed tech, the digital solutions in particular, you know, there's a lot of issues here. Teachers don't really have the skills and the pedagogical kind of knowledge to use digital ed tech, um, big gap there. Um, there is overall a real limited measurement and assessment of learning um, when we're using these um, digital technologies. Um, so there's also a real lack of feedback there, I'll just sort of add um, to learners, which you, know, you can present, um, you can deliver um, teaching via digital approaches, but and all ed tech approaches, but you really need to give children feedback as well. Um, the findings also suggested that there's a gap in um, the measurement of impact of, of these ed tech initiatives, both during and post COVID-19. So kind of some like future research areas there. Um, big question about scalability in the context of resource constraints. Excuse me, there's an example that we pulled out, um, which is you can have lots and lots of children, obviously, but only a small proportion of those will be reached with their tech solutions. And that's a particular example there from Madagascar. Um, of course, we have our marginalized groups as well. Um, so I think it was already mentioned that children with disabilities, um, girls, 
uh, in particular, and also children living in forced displacement um, also always um, suffer disproportionately. Um, and it's always interesting to look at how does their tech help to deal with this? Has it has it enabled um, these groups at all? Um, and hand in hand with that, um, this, the big topic of safeguarding measures that need to be in place. Um, that's kind of like two double pronged there. There's, there's the issue of safeguarding when children are not in school and all the, the sort of gender-based violence and child abuse that goes on at home, which is incredibly difficult um, to deal with. But then also we need safety measures when there's online teaching. So there's kind of side issues there as well. Um, again, reinforced was the importance of um, parental engagement in education provision. I mean, parents with small children, I know many of them, um, really found this difficult. Um, even, you know, those who've had some experience in education, you know, they they have their children at home all day. Uh, they need to be supported on how to provide um, distance learning. And of course, teachers as well. So I think their teachers need open access teaching materials. That could be one way of, of kind of easing that for teachers. Um, to provide distance learning and parents also need a lot of guidance on how to use any tech type solutions, distance learning solutions in the absence of the teacher. Um, finally, um, just to just say, although many other interesting points, um, the study really did highlight, again, that potential for the collaboration between the private sector, for example, telecom operators and providers and governments um, to be realized beyond COVID-19. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that, but it's, um, yeah, that's everything connect from connectivity um, for access and, and also, um, yeah, just provision of, of the whole the whole and full range of EdTech solutions. Uh, so I'll hand over again to Juliet for some policy implications. That's right. And um, thank you, Gita. And uh, so to wrap up, um, we just wanted to share, you know, some thoughts on what we see as the implica policy implications for the report. Uh, and in uh, Dr. Arna's presentation, as well as um, the points shared by Hannah, uh, it really does emerge that, you know, that it, it's very much inconsistent with the, the, the three key messages that we would like to highlight. Um, first, you know, as we celebrate uh, Africa Day, um, you know, I have to say the time is, um, the timing of this is really, really excellent uh, because the question, so, you know, there's just some questions from the findings that we found that we we, we, we thought would be great to, to, to reflect on. Um, in order to, one is in order to avoid getting, you know, for, in, in order to prevent this, opportunity uh, from becoming an unfulfilled promise. Um, what do we need to do? What does the sector need to do? Uh, and what do the duty bearers need to do um, in Africa in order for, for this not to remain just as, a, as an opportunity? Um, and, and we know that you know, the, the Africa we want uh, as set out in the agenda 2063, uh, will certainly not be built, uh, will not be um, actioned or realized um, without, it will not be attained without, without really trans making some transformational changes. Um, and this Africa that we want uh, will also not be attained if we go back to business as usual, as we understand. And these are, thought, these are sentiments echoed across not just the, 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 the sector of ed tech um, and the research community, but also in the CSO space in, in general, that, um, that it has to be, we cannot reopen schools and then go back to, to factory settings as we call it, all right? So how do we absorb, in order to absorb shocks from future, uh, related to future disruptions that happen, as Dr. Roda has just highlighted, the disruptions uh, and some of the countries where the study was undertaken are, particularly have, have already experienced that. Some, some are on a higher index of possibility of possibilities of experiencing such disruptions. And how can we ensure that as, 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 as education systems at the center, ministries of education, as they work towards, in terms of seizing the moment, as there's a greater debate and great interest in 
um, shock proofing our education systems? How can EdTech take center stage of those, those, those preparedness measures uh, so that there's, there's more uh, continuity um, than um, for when, when, when future disruptions of this scale happen? Um, and secondly, attention to uh, paying attention to the infrastructure issues that have come out very strongly. And I was really um, pleased to see that that's also very much aligned. A combination of access to the infrastructure as well as the socioeconomic barriers that prevent uh, uh, communities and children, uh, teachers and families from being able to attain this goal, from being able to, to, to to really benefit uh, and and make use of, of this potential, this um, ed tech potential, both high tech and low tech potential, really. And the last point here really is about um, you know what we saw in the report was that they so the, there are some limitations within the education system. For instance, you know large classes, what we consider to be perennial problems, chronic problems in some countries, as we understand. Um, so before uh, you know the the you know we what we see here is that the before introducing advanced ed tech solutions there are some basic uh, issues that need to be addressed um, in order to incorporate that um, in order to to move forward with regards to advancing solutions and so this is this is in particular with understanding the most advanced solutions uh, that we understand and finally. Uh, at the end of it, I think uh, it, it, it's important to realize also that uh, th this is really the, mo the moment where um, the, the budgets for education have to be protected. Um, ultimately, when we're looking at what the, uh, the findings from the study, the, everything that points to what we found, um, what we saw the authors highlight um, and suggests a, a very strong key message around the need to protecting the the education budgets in order to deliver uh, on education provision, even when there's a disruption that takes place. Um, so we'll pause here um, and then hand it back to, I think, Louis. Um, it, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to comment on, 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 the, on the report. Yes, thank you, Juliet and uh, Gita. That was fantastic. I mean, it really gives us already some pointers uh, of a the way that uh, GCE should in future sort of relate to those issues. I mean, we already have a campaign on education financing and education in emergencies. And now to sort of bring it all together uh, with regards to what education technology can uh, provide in terms of uh, remedying disruptions or mitigating them uh, is an interesting approach and I think that will help us to sort of formulate uh, advocacy messages but uh, before we go into that discussion uh, I want to invite now our three country examples to tell us what where they are what kind of uh, piloting approach they have chosen and what it tells them. We'll start with the case from Namibia. I'll invite Martin uh, Matsuip from Nexo to sort of give us his uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, overview of the pilot that is also being funded by GIZ Backup Education Initiative. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, in my culture, they say that women always have a last say. And so it's always very difficult to speak after these powerful women had made their comments. So, uh, and most of what will come in my presentation uh, had already been mentioned because by Rhonda. And I can accept that. Uh, uh, you have frozen. Martin, can you hear us? Is it only me who has a problem to hear Martin or is that a general 
Salma, can you hear Martin or is he frozen? No, uh, Martin seems to be frozen. If he can maybe switch his video off and then continue, I think that would be better. It will help his network as well. Martin, did you hear that message? If not, we'll just sort of uh, ask him. Uh, I'll send him a WhatsApp message. Uh, and I think he's gone now. So we will just not lose too much time. And we are going to ask uh, Denise to come in as in second place. Denise, est-ce que tu pourrais nous donner donc uh, la présentation que tu as préparée et qu'on puisse donc avoir un peu d'informations sur ce qui se passe uh, à Burundi grâce à, au travail de Bafache Big? Denise, tu nous entends? Aya, ah, yeah. est-ce que tu peux répondre pour qu'on puisse, qu puisse te. Ok, she starts sharing the screen. Can you come closer to, the, to your machine and speak into the microphone? And you can you have the floor now. Thank you very much, Denise Kandondo, the national coordinator from Burundi, from the National uh, Education Coalition. Over to you. Yeah, it's fine. Allez-y, allez-y. J'espère que les interprètes peuvent t'entendre. Vous m'entendez très bien. Je vais essayer de parler très haut. Yeah, allez-y. Ah, d'accord. Yeah, that's fine. Allez-y. Ah, oui. Ah, comme le temps est très petit, 15 minutes, c'est pas beaucoup. Ah, je vais essayer ah, de, de, de revenir sur la situation de l'éducation numérique au Burundi, ah, surtout pendant la crise de la, de la COVID-19 et, et, et l'importance ou le rôle de l'éducation numérique qu'elle a compte de cette situation au Burundi et d'autres situations que nous allons présenter. Et quels sont les atouts potentiels de l'éducation numérique au Burundi qui, qui sont là, qui pouvaient aider à la, à la, à la mise en œuvre de cette initiative que je dirais nouveau. Et je vais présenter aussi quelles sont les limites des solutions numériques au Burundi tenant compte Uh, de, 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 des actions qu'on a déjà menées uh, dans le cadre du projet uh, de l'initiative Backup intitulée uh, Éducation numérique, uh, numérique à la base de l'éducation numérique au Burundi. Uh, je vais aussi uh, présenter quelles sont les solutions alternatives, mais aussi uh, les leçons apprises par rapport à la mise en œuvre de ce projet uh, jusqu'à l'heure actuelle qui pourrait euh, nous guider à, à l'avenir. Euh, voilà, euh, sans autre de la situation de l'éducation numérique au Burundi, euh, on dirait que, euh, surtout, euh, je dis, euh, n'est pas en général, mais à l'école, dans le milieu scolaire, l'apprentissage à milieu scolaire n'est pas encore numérisé, il est toujours dispensé à créer. Et dans la plupart des établissements, euh, les cours en PC sont dispensés par des enseignants, des enseignants non formés à la matière, puisqu'on a vu euh, que 80% des études qu'on a menées euh, ne maîtrisaient pas l'exploitation des outils numériques, euh, moins encore ne savaient pas euh, se servir euh, de numérique comme Zoom, Matini pour qu'on puisse euh, à, enseigner à distance. Euh, donc, même dans les, dans les 15 euh, euh, écoles pilotes euh, où on a pris ces enseignants pour les former, euh, pratiquement, ils avaient euh, des contrats très bas à la matière. Euh, L'exploitation euh, du numérique n'est pas limitée dans le milieu scolaire seulement, mais aussi au, au Burundi en général. Euh, la, 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 la numérique n'est pas du tout euh, euh, généralisé euh, par, par rapport, euh, d'après l'étude euh, menée par le PUMID, euh, qui a montré que 8% pour, 
a seulement débondé au accès à l'Internet. Et ce qui a fait que même pendant la pandémie du COVID-19, euh, chez nous, euh, on n'a pas pu se servir les, euh, de ces, je dirais que de, 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 de l'enseignement à distance, puisqu'on n'a pas pu, euh, les écoles n'ont pas euh, été fermées. Non, parce que euh, la pandémie n'était pas là. Euh, Peut-être qu'on a vu que euh, on périait. Uh, puisque la, le numérique n'est pas du tout très avancé. Et même s'il y a eu des fermetures, il n'y a pas eu des fermetures d'école pendant la crise, et la perturbation ne sont pas manquées à ce sens que la pandémie a paralysé les autres acteurs euh, de la vie nationale, tels que la santé et l'économie. Et la et, et l'éducation est, est transversale, et ce qui a fait que même la l'éducation à souffert. Donc, euh, euh, par rapport à, à ce qu'on euh, avait, par rapport euh, à ce que tout le monde a pu traverser suite à la COVID-19, euh, le rôle et l'importance de l'éducation numérique pourra être oui. oui. Allô? Vous m'entendez? Oui, pour moi, ça va. Donc, par rapport à ce que euh, le Burundi a traversé de la, la pandémie du COVID-19 et par rapport à ce que le monde entier a traversé, euh, le rôle et l'importance de l'éducation numérique à la situation de, de crise, euh, donc euh, le numérique pourra avoir une pour ça, ça peut en situation de crise, mais aussi euh, et surtout chez nous, euh, il y a des exemples typiques durant ces deux dernières années. Il y a eu des fortes pluies persistantes qui suivi des inondations, des glissements de terre, qui ont fait que les, 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 les classes, les écoles, les marchés et d'autres euh, euh, établissements euh, ont fermé les, 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 les portes suite à des inondations, euh, donc des changements climatiques en plus de la COVID-19. Donc, euh, tenant compte euh, de ce qu'on a vu de, de les structurer, il pourra aussi euh, résoudre le problème allié avec l'éducation des groupes marginalisés ou vulnérables, euh, vu que euh, malgré la réforme du système éducatif euh, depuis 2019 au Burundi, il y a encore euh, en dehors de l'école, plus de 38,8% euh, euh, de l'ensemble euh, de des enfants en âge de scolarisation et surtout euh, les enfants euh, marginaux ou vulnérables, euh, que ce les filles et les albinos, les orphelins, euh, enfin des ménages pauvres, ou les rapatriés déplacés et déplacés de guerre. Donc, pour dire que Uh, les solutions numériques pour l'éducation numérique, uh, j'ai un point nommé. Uh, D'autres que je peux citer comme importance uh, d'initier uh, les solutions numériques pour l'éducation numérique au Burundi, c'est le développement des compétences, à ce sens que je dis que uh, les enseignants à 80% uh, n'ont pas, uh, ne savent pas. Euh, manipuler, on ne sait pas exploiter euh, les outils. Alors qu'il y a aussi euh, cette problématique de renforcement des capacités de, des enseignants et des enfants. Euh, avec les solutions numériques aussi, on peut atteindre les apprenants vivant dans des zones éloignées, euh, dans des zones plus éloignées où la numérisation de l'éducation pourra permettre une économie de temps et d'argent pour les apprenants des zones retirées, mais aussi pour rejoindre les lieux d'apprentissage euh, à, à, qui sont à distance. Euh, chez nous, il y a aussi euh, le problème des gestions des classes pléthoriques, où on trouve que euh, les ratios élèves salles de classe varient de 48,2 à 124,3 ou 3 à 5 par bas pupitre des enfants, à 6 à 3 à 5 bas pupitre. 
Et ce qui favorise la bande ou la dégradation de la, de la carte de l'enseignement au Burundi, si la, la bande est très significative, je vais dire zéro à 38 pour ça. Donc, une fois initié à, à la, 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 la numérique, la digitalisation de l'éducation, ça pourra à contribuer. Et d'ailleurs, c'est dans ce sens que la, co la coalition a euh, vu que la numérisation de l'éducation pourra avoir une importance capitale pour euh, l'amélioration de la qualité, euh, l'inclusion ou l'accès de l'éducation dans telle situation que je viens de citer. Et c'est d'ailleurs dans ce cadre qu'il a initié le projet euh, Solution numérique au service de l'éducation de base en fait de contribuer à l'amélioration des conditions d'apprentissage dans la, dans la mise en place des solutions numériques dans l'éducation de base. Il est à noter euh, que ce projet est un peu spécial et innovant à ce sens qu'il est un projet pilote au Burundi et qui a attiré une attention particulière auprès de nos bénéficiaires et les partenaires et responsables de l'éducation euh, euh, aussi. Uh, je peux dire que uh, dans le processus de mise en œuvre de ce projet uh, qui a commencé avec ce canon mois de mars, c'est le ministère de l'Éducation qui nous accompagne uh, via le, la direction générale de la science et de la technologie et de la recherche, uh, qui nous appuie dans les sensibilisations, uh, qui nous appuie dans les recherches et qui nous appuie dans d'autres actions de plaidoyer uh, qui sont uh, prévues dans ce projet. Euh, quels sont les, les atouts euh, qu'on a vu euh, dira ce processus de ce projet euh, initié depuis euh, le mois de mars et qui était euh, surtout basé sur euh, les recherches, euh, surtout euh, qui voulait voir quelle est la situation euh, de l'éducation numérique au Burundi, quel est le rôle joué par les médias et qui était aussi basé sur des actions de sensibilisation de tous les parties prenantes, mais aussi la, pro la production euh, des outils de sensibilisation. On a vu que euh, finalement, euh, les atouts de la conciliation de l'éducation numérique au Burundi euh, sont surtout euh, le ministère en charge de TIC est là. On a chez nous le ministère en charge de TIC. Il y a aussi la Direction générale de la science, de la technologie et de la recherche au sein du ministère euh, que je viens de citer, qui nous a accompagnés dans, sa, dans ce projet. Il y a aussi l'instauration euh, de l'enseignement de TIC à l'école fondamentale pour former les enseignants euh, qui bientôt euh, vont former euh, les élèves. Comme je l'ai dit, euh, auparavant, il n'y avait pas des enseignants formés, mais pour le moment, avec la pluie de l'Enabé, il y a l'installation de l'enseignement de TIC à l'école euh, normale, euh, donc supérieure. Il y a aussi une formation initiale de fixer les enseignants à TIC, ce que je viens de dire. Il y a aussi euh, la déclaration, la volonté, que je dis la volonté politique, puisque le, le président a déclaré dernièrement qu'il faut euh, absolument euh, numériser tous les secteurs de la vie nationale. Uh, il y a aussi l'implication des différentes parties tenant dans la promotion de l'éducation inclusive, ce qu'on a constaté dans la mise en œuvre de ce projet. Notamment, uh, il y a la coalition uh, qui est en train de mettre à, à, à en œuvre ce projet de solution numérique. Il y a aussi un appel uh, qui uh, se complète, c'est plus qu'il y a les, les contenus de bibliothèques numériques. Il y a aussi le programme de et RFI qui donne des tablettes qui soutiennent les enfants. Il y a aussi uh, la bibliothèque sans frontières. Uh, il y a aussi le niveau d'adhésion élevé des accès du système éducatif dans le processus de l'éducation. Uh, comme je l'ai dit, on a constaté uh, avec les actions de sensibilisation uh, qu'il y a ouverture d'esprit et vers des autorités scolaires sur la valorisation et l'exploitation des opportunités déjà existant, puisqu'on a constaté que même ceux qui avaient peu d'équipement de, 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 ne l'utilisaient pas, mais cette fois-ci, à l'heure actuelle, ils commencent à, 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 donc à exploiter, à utiliser ces outils. Denise, euh, il te reste deux minutes. 
Uh, notamment, il y a aussi un manque de données fiables et actualisées sur la situation du numérique au Burundi. Il y a aussi une faible synergie entre les intervenants dans le secteur éducatif. Donc, chacun travaille à sa part. Si on faisait là, une synergie, peut-être qu'on aura uh, beaucoup de choses à faire ou la tête de l'objectif. Il y a aussi l'utilisation des solutions numériques et financières qui n'est pas du tout dans la culture des de Burundi. Uh, la faible taux d'alphabétisation uh, au Burundi aussi et la faible pénétration des appareils téléphoniques, la faible pénétration de l'électricité qui est là. Uh, il y a aussi les capacités financières des citoyens qui ne peuvent pas uh, se procurer de ces outils, l'adéquation entre les services offerts et les besoins réels, l'insuffisance du contenu numérique, le cadre juridique et réglementaire inadéquat uh, jusqu'à présent et la marginalisation des communautés euh, dans la communauté rurale qui, qui n'ont pas accès à l'électricité ou qui n'ont pas euh, des outils. Voilà. Euh, euh, la plupart des contenus numériques locaux est encore hébergé à l'étranger, ce qui est problématique et l'objet limité qui est alloué à, 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 aux solutions numériques. Donc, euh, comme solution, euh, c'est ce qu'on est en train de faire, renforcement des capacités, euh, accroître la visibilité de l'accessibilité, mettre en place un cadre juridique. On en va plaider pour qu'il y ait un cadre juridique, euh, bien sûr, et inverser la marginalisation et les difficultés potentielles euh, à ce sens-là. Donc, euh, avec ce qu'on est en train de mettre en œuvre, il y a des leçons tirées. Surtout, les TIC sont encore plus théoriques au Burundi que pratiques euh, dans les écoles. Euh, par rapport à la situation initiale de l'éducation numérique au Burundi et l'intérêt que les bénéficiaires ont y réservé, on a vu que les délais de mise en œuvre relatifs de ce projet est, est, est très court. Il y a aussi les usages des moyens, comme je viens de le dire. Euh, il y a aussi, euh, le projet est venu à point nommé, puisqu'on a vu, euh, vu la situation qui est traversée le monde, en général et le Burundi, euh, les catastrophes naturelles, les crasses pétroliques, les problèmes d'accès et des groupes marginalisés. Euh, comme d'autres ressources tirées, il y a nécessité de conjonction entre les différents intervenants pour réussir et la pénalisation euh, des acquis de cette initiative. Il y a aussi une volonté politique à qui euh, pour, euh, il faut une volonté politique à qui pour la mise à l'échelle de l'initiative, d'où la nécessité d'accentuer euh, les actions de plaidoyer auprès des décideurs et la conscientisation de chaque partie prenante. Et voilà, euh, peut-être que j'ai été très, très rapide, euh, je m'excuse, mais c'est c'est ça, je t'ai fini mon, mon exposé. Il y a élu une autre question, je suis à votre disposition. Merci. Merci Denise, ça nous donne une impression de ce que vous faites et les éléments que vous avez pu choisir. Donc, ça va être intéressant de faire un peu la comparaison avec les autres pilotages qu'on est en train de faire. Donc, je vais maintenant... Essayer. I'm going to try to see whether Martin is now ready to sort of present his case. Martin, can you unmute yourself and bring your presentation back to the screen? Yeah, uh, I will. I will do that. Uh, just give me time. Uh, so I can quickly get my presentation back to the screen. Yeah, I had some problems with the connection because it's very unstable around here. So, yeah, just switch is opening on. up. Okay. Hello. Yes, go you ahead. Can... Just bring your presentation. We see 
you posted then the uh, screen now, which you, I think you can just sort of uh, delete it or, or switch it off. Just go to your own presentation. I have resumed share. Yes. Can you see it on the screen? Go ahead, yes. You're on now. Okay. Um, you know, in, in, in short, um, uh, I just wanted to say uh, the our our project is uh, titled uh, Every Home is a Learning Environment and Every Parent is a Potential Teacher. So what we meant with this is that we, 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 we have observed over the years that uh, mostly the interventions that come uh, during uh, 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 the, the problems of this magnitude are mainly focusing on teachers and schools. And our NGO had a problem with that because mostly we observed that parents uh, were ignored in this regard. So uh, my presentation, uh, I will focus on the background of the of 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 of, of our, uh, and then I will summarize what we what is happening in Namibia, how the funding is done in Namibia, and what is the current situation as far as uh, educational technology is concerned in the country, and then the justification of the two projects that we have got. The one is from Nantu as well as from the Namibian Education Coalition for Civil Society Organizations. And then I will pinpoint certain aspects that are actually there on the ICP policy of the, of the Ministry of Education. And also some recent literature that we uh, delved upon when we uh, submitted this proposal to, to, for the backup initiative and the next steps that we are going to take. Uh, uh, briefly, the background is that, uh, and it was already alluded to by Rhonda, and maybe some of these issues are repetitive because Rhonda has done justice to what is actually happening in Namibia, and uh, her report, uh, the, the uh, or the paper indicates clearly uh, the, the issues and everything that she conducted with us, but. Uh, by 17th of March in 2020, a state of emergency was declared in Namibia. And, uh, uh, and this was called the phase one of the state of emergency. So what meant was all schools would have to be closed, um, early childhood centers closed, and all tertiary institutions were closed in the country. Because the first case of COVID-19 was discovered in Namibia on the 13th of March. And on the 17th of March, the government declared a state of emergency. Um, after the state of emergency was declared, it ran from March. It was supposed to run from March to August, uh, almost for six months. And during these six months, uh, all necessary uh, 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 things were supposed to be put in place to compact the, the, the further spread of, of COVID-19. So, and uh, when the school said to reopen, it was supposed to come into phased in manner. But during this period when the state of emergency was declared, um, there was a circular from the ministry that prescribed that learning from home should take place, which means, for example, children, should continue receiving instruction and learning, but it should take place at home. So, but uh, the face-to-face -face teaching was impossible uh, during this period. And even after August, the, the, the phasing in of face-to-face -face teaching was not possible. So, and, and, and this learning from home had some complications and difficulties. So what happened when, when this happened is that the teachers were, uh, were making copies, as Rhonda alluded to, and distributing copies and some learning material to learners at a designated spot in a town 
or sometimes the learners had to come to school at a certain day and collect study material, and they have to do assignments, they have to write home tests, and they have to hand them in and get marks from them. So, the, and then, then uh, around November, the, 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 the stage for phase one uh, was stopped and the learners had to go back to face-to-face -to -face learning. Now, when they had to go back to face-to-face -face learning, there were three modes of, 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 of instruction that were supposed to take place. One was platooning, phase-in approach, and time-based cohorts and distributed groups. So depending on the circumstances of every school, the school had to decide what type of, 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 of learning mode they have to take. So some schools had two groups of the same learners, and other schools uh, were having platooning where some learners had to come to school in the morning and the other group come in the afternoon. This was necessitated because of, because, uh, of, of social distancing issues because uh, learners had to be seated. If a classroom has got 40 learners, that classroom was broken down into 20, 20 learners, and one group had to come to school on a specific day and the other group on the next day. So this way, the manners in which, for example, the first in of the, after the reopening of the school state took place, and that was in 2020, uh, it still happens at some schools. But uh, and even, the promotion requirements were lowered. The, the syllabus was rationalized, which means, for example, eight core topics or themes were taken out of most of the subjects, and the teachers only had to teach those. And the other part of the whole syllabus was supposed to be covered in the next year or in the years to come. Uh, the promotion requirements were lowered from 40 to 35 for grades one to nine. And one thing that I have highlighted here is that during the stage of reopening, it was imperative that parents were to assist their children to learn from home using the prepared material by the teachers. So they had to get uh, information from the online platforms, or they had to use libraries, or they had to get information in one way or the other, and they had to assist their children because there was no face-to-face -face teaching taking place. There was no formal online platform at that stage in the provided by the government or in the country that the learners could use. So now what made our project uh, uh, a necessity was that uh, uh, digital learning uh, was not accessible to, 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 to learners at home. And, and we thought that since digital learning was not accessible to learners at home, there must be a way that we have to empower the capacity of the parents. So we decided, okay, let's focus, let's see how we can have a maximum reach in the country for this project if we have to submit the project. Commerce is central, uh, uh, it's a central region in the country. Kunene is in the Northwest. Uh, and then we have got Oshana, which is north central. Avango East and West, it's the upper north regions. And then we have the Omaheke, that is east central and hard up in the south. So in order to have a maximum reach and have footprints of this project all over the country, we thought that we have to focus on these seven regions. And what will happen is, we will. We initially started to do a needs assessment survey as the project prescribed. The needs assessment survey informed us what are the needs, what are the needs of mostly the parents of children between grade one and seven. Those little ones, what are the needs? What are their, do they have access to, to digital devices? Do they have training? Uh, do they have the basic skills to access a computer? What platforms do they use? And all these things uh, were informed by the needs assessment survey that we already conducted. We developed a work plan in order to provide totalities for the rollout of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the project. And then we had discussions with the stakeholders. We engaged the NAMPOWER, which is a power utility, 
We are at an advanced stage of discussing with the mobile telecommunications network that is MTC. Now, the what we want from MTC is that um, at least the ideal that we are striving for is that in every household, there should be at least a laptop and connectivity to the internet. So, and we trust that these uh, discussions uh, will be very successful uh, and, and we will eventually see whether they can have tailor-made bundles for the households that they can get on a cheaper rate. So, and then eventually during the rollout, we will provide training to the households. And once we leave them with a certificate, then they will be able to have access to a gadget or, or and internet connectivity. Uh, Martin, the, you have got, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you yeah. are, are biting in our time budget. So I'll give you four more minutes and then you must come to an end. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I will do so. Uh, so let's say, Basically, the summary of the project, uh, at the current situation, there is no uh, online platform in the education sector. Uh, uh, the, the private schools have you make use of tablets and etc. But what is mostly affected are the government schools, the public schools, who do not have access to an online platform. Uh, now, this project has got three main pillars. Uh, we want to bridge the cost of access, the cost of usage, and the lack of basic computer skills among households. And once we have negotiated the cost of access and cost of usage with the service providers, and then train the people on basic computer skills, we may be able to resolve the problem of online learning that can be provided. Now, I will leave the objectives of the uh, uh, ICT policy, because the in main intention of the ICT policy of the ministry is to create ICT literate citizens, which will, for example, um, influence the education sector and so forth. Uh, uh, these are basically the issues in our project. Currently, we have done the needs assessment survey. We have developed the manual, which is still going to come online. And what is pending is we have to publish the survey report, we have to publish the manual, and then we have to launch the project. Once we launch a project immediately the following day, we will train the trainers, and then trainers will roll it out in the regions. Those are the next steps that we intend to follow. Linda. Thank you so much, Martin, for this uh, interesting approach where an important stakeholder group, namely parents, is being targeted. That's fantastic. I think we can learn a lot from that. So I will now uh, give the floor to Benedicto from Malawi. Uh, Benedicto, are you ready? Please, Martin, can you uh, stop your screen sharing. That's great. And uh, on this side of Benedicto, you can come into now and show your PowerPoint, your screen. There you are. Welcome, Benedicto. And over to you. Are you unmuted? Benedicto, can you uh, speak? Can you oh, hear me, you Wolfgang? Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So we'll share some insights, highlights from Malawi uh, within the context of EduTech. So that is a synopsis of the outline. It is not, okay. So I, I, I think as a matter of introduction, uh, the slide was meant just to highlight the importance of education, more so uh, the importance of education in the context of marginalized uh, 
groups, and these could be girls, children with a disability, and the ultra poor population. Um, in terms of the general status, uh, it would be important to mention that uh, during the first and second wave, so from March 2020 to October 2020, in terms of uh, the disruption that we, we had in the education sector, it affected around 7.7 uh, .7 million school age children. This is according to the UNICEF report. And when online lessons were introduced, we also witnessed uh, a cut in terms of the taught time. So for senior classes that learn for maybe six plus hours, only six hours were spent for those that were able to access online. We also saw disparity between the private schools and public schools, in that in the public schools, uh, relatively uh, students were able to access uh, education, whilst in the public school, it was a complete shutdown. So just a summary, and I think these are the sort of things that the researchers and my area uh, colleagues have already hinted to in terms of the negative impact of COVID-19 with regard to prolonged school closure. So when perhaps learners and teachers anticipated that schools would close within two weeks, government had to extend the closure, um, then leading to a complete disruption where schools had to close regardless of their circumstances. So that was just to summarize. In terms of the specific challenges, I think one major issue that we have in Malawi relates to access. So only 14% of Malawians have access to internet. And 17, only 17% 17 have access to television. 32% have access to a radio. 52% have access to mobile. So I think these are huge factors in as far as edutech is concerned, which largely uh, uh, does not favor uh, the ultra poor uh, population. So I think when we are talking about edutech, we must take cognizance uh, of these realities. Then issues of shortage of textbooks. So the national policy is one-to-one, -one, that is book-to-learner ratio. Uh, but in, in, in most cases, on average, uh, the ratio is one to five. So again, a huge implication, especially if you are looking at um, alternative ways of learning. Um, if learners have to, to do most of their work at home, do you have sufficient textbooks to support learning? And I think this um, uh, is a major issue. Then again, the issue of lack of support for special needs, because there are uh, disabilities, some forms of disabilities that require specialist attention. Now in the context of shutdown or a complete closure, and you want uh, education to be provided through alternative means, this may be on, on, um, uh, online or may, may be at home, how do you make sure that uh, uh, special needs learners that require such, a, such support um, are, uh, is provided? Then quickly looking at the potential of technology-based solution. Um, I, I, I think our understanding is that it mitigates the enduring challenges for the education sector, especially if you look at the high pupil teacher ratio, if you use online, um, I, I think the issue of high pupil teacher ratio may not be an issue. The issue of high pupil classroom ratio may not be an issue, especially if you are using um, uh, uh, edutech as an alternative uh, uh, mode of learning. Um, then I think fewer resources would be required to provide uniform quality education um, um, uh, in, in terms of resources because of the issue of harmonization uh, of the methodologies.
then the obvious inescapable limitations from our point of view is that uh, edutech cannot substitute for some of the auxiliary benefits of in-person learning, especially if you look at access to regular nutritious meals, especially in the, uh, in, in the lower classes, where such a support is provided, it becomes exceedingly difficult uh, to maintain the same when learners are in, the, in, in their home. So I think that is one of the ins, uh, inescapable limitations. In terms of the impact quickly, uh, one of the major impact has been loss of uh, uh, learning uh, because as, as, as I hinted online, um, uh, the student could only learn for three hours, especially for the senior classes, when in the ordinary setting, uh, they would learn for six hours. So I think loss of time uh, has been a major uh, impact. Uh, also the issue of teenage pregnancies within a short period of time, based on the Minister of Gender Statistics, we registered within a space of eight months, we registered 40,000 uh, uh, teenage pregnancies. And also within the same period, we registered 25,000 um, um, early marriages. So a huge, uh, uh, impact uh, that COVID had uh, in this country. Then also, uh, learners with special needs, um, they, 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 they were not uh, attended to, especially if you look at uh, the online learning, the radio programs, uh, especially those who cannot read and hear, I think there wasn't any support, meaning that the alternative um, education that was provided was meant for those that did not have uh, special needs. So a huge implication because it meant largely taking them out of the education system. Then in accessibility, I already hinted, now striking a balance between the uh, rural urban divide. Uh, so you talk about the hard to reach areas where network is, is a big issue, access to uh, to uh, uh, mobile phones is an issue. How do you make sure that there is equity? So a huge issue in as far as the access to alternative modes uh, uh, were concerned. Then in conclusion, what are we learning from all this? I think one issue is that whilst edutech appears to be exciting. I think what would be key is to make sure that we mainstream inclusivity in the edutech, making sure that we are not targeting a special group of learners, but that everyone should be supported. So inclusivity of edutech would be quite fundamental um, uh, in as far as we're concerned. Then structural response is important because needs in rural areas, are different from needs, uh, some of the needs in the urban setting. So when we are designing edutech, we must think about the variations and, 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 and the, the varying context in which education uh, will be provided. And, and in order to do this, I think it will be important that uh, we bring on board different strategies that promote change, that promote accommodation, that promote reform, the orientation, restructuring, and, and, and so forth. And if we bring together all these strategies, we'll be able to reach, um, uh, to meet the diverse needs of, of the learners in the schools. Um, I think that is where um, I'll, I'll, I'll be ending. Let me finish by the last slide, which is trying to exemplify the importance of partnership and collaboration. In the edutech world, it is important that we strengthen uh, and, and make coordination and partnership intended. Um, so bringing on board the private sector, development partners, and all other players that my area speakers have hinted. But more so, we also need to promote community partnership harvesting. Uh, you can't just have uh, a partnership that works at a national level. I think what is fundamentally important is to harvest partnership at a community level where learners are supposed to, uh, to learn. So trying to identify strategic partners within the community setting that can add value 
to the um, uh, edutech as an alternative mode of providing education. That would be all, uh, Wolfgang, in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Benedicto. That was great. And thank you also for uh, squeezing it a little bit. I mean, the full uh, set of slides will be shared with everyone on this webinar. There's no worry about that. Um, we are a little bit behind time, but I think we have uh, the liberty of the translator still being around for a bit. I just have to find out with Salma whether that is the case. We mean, yeah, up to 5.20, that should be all right. I hope that is possible. So in that case, I would uh, want my colleague Luis Eduardo to take over now and take us through a Q&A session, uh, trying to sort of hammer out some findings or uh, recommendations that we can take forward uh, for the future of ed tech and uh, in how, how can it mitigate disruptions in the education system. Over to you, Luis, and welcome. Thank to you, Wolfgang. This. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your okay. wonderful presentations and contributions. So it's expected to have 20 minutes for the Q&A, but maybe we can do in 10 minutes instead, because there are, it's OK, Wolfgang, 10 minutes? Yeah, it's fine. If we OK. We, well, okay. so um, no time to lose. So I, any comment, questions for the speakers is very welcome. Uh, so please use the chat box or you just can ask the question. I don't see at the moment any questions in the chat box. Hello, everyone is invited to ask a question if you want, but meanwhile, people think about their question. Maybe we can think something about that the NFR review has really addressed. And I want to ask, uh, to Rhonda and uh, also the colleagues who presented today, um, Denise, Martin, and Benedicto, what could be kind of the policy critical challenge in these countries to be addressed in terms of um, addressing the so-called digital divide? Can you repeat yourself as the question to us? Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Martin. I was asking what could be the critical challenges, for example, in your country uh, to address the so-called multiple dimensions of the digital divide, what the government needs to deliver. You see, uh, in my country, we have the ICT policy. And the ICT policy should just be implemented because, because, because it, it talks about the, the using of educational technology in schools. And uh, I think it, 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 we just need the, the political will of, 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 of the leaders of the day. Of, but uh, the, 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 the people do not yet it, it, because some people call it the third world attitude, where, where, where somebody would say, for example, it's not possible that we can have computers in every classroom, that every household should have a, a computer and internet connectivity. So, but uh, it, it's something that we have to push as a civil society and work hard on, because it's a serious challenge. They're actually, the cost of, of, of connectivity also it's a big thing. It's very expensive to have internet in Namibia, for example. I think. Thank to... you. Thank you, Martin. Anybody else want to address the question? Um, in the context of Malawi, I think he, two are key challenges in as far as edge tech is concerned. 
in respect of what govern, our government has to deliver. Uh, number one is the issue of strike, uh, structural issues with regard to connectivity uh, in our schools, because edutech can't be used as an alternative mode of learning if connectivity is still um, uh, a big challenge as is currently the case. Uh, secondly is the issue of uh, tariffs on uh, edutech. Um, so I'm, I'm, my colleague in Namibia is talking about costs uh, for accessing um, uh, the different programs that would be uh, on the offer in as far as learning is concerned. So these are major issues because what it would mean is that government has to reduce taxes uh, 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 um, uh, imposed on the uh, private uh, telecommunications which in the process should translate into these companies also reducing uh, the cost for data, the cost for gadget, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Benedicto. I see another question from Wolfgang in the chat box. So, oh, I don't see now the question. Just one moment, please. Uh, the question is how should advocacy strategies balance the call for complex tech e.g. laptops and smartphones versus easy access tech like the radio? I suppose the question is for all the speakers. And you can read it in the chat box. Denise, go ahead, please. Merci. Euh, juste, je voulais euh, répondre à la première question à lien avec les difficultés majeures et le petit euh, et comme défi au Burundi. Euh, euh, comme je vous l'ai dit, ce n'est pas un problème de l'électricité euh, de, 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 de laptop qui est euh, premier lié. Et surtout, c'est la, la volonté politique à, à se sentir aujourd'hui, euh, même si on a pris les écoles pilotes pour Uh, les initiés à l'exploitation à l'utilisation des outils numériques ou la digitalisation de l'éducation. On se pose la question jusqu'à présent, il n'y a pas de stratégie sectorielle comme document d'orientation pour la digitalisation de l'éducation. Donc, les, les écoles, les directeurs et responsables de l'éducation, tant qu'il n'y a pas ces, cette, cette stratégie mise en place par le ministère de l'éducation, on ne peut pas euh, se prendre à, à initier l'éducation la, 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 numérique, euh, l'éducation à distance dans les écoles. Quoi. Autre chose très importante, euh, il y a ce, au Burundi, surtout je dis au Burundi, euh, ce manque euh, de données euh, fiables et actualisées à la matière, euh, comme je vous l'ai dit auparavant. Au, au Burundi, ce n'est pas comme dans d'autres pays qui se sont apprêtés à suite à la situation de la COVID-19. Le Burundi n'a pas connu la, le confinement comme d'autres pays. Donc, euh, il n'a pas pu s'agiter à, à utiliser ou à initier l'éducation à distance à ce sens-là. Donc, euh, il n'y a pas euh, de données jusque-là euh, sur euh, la matière. Autre chose, jusqu'à présent, il y a peu d'intervenants en matière d'initiation de l'éducation numérique ou de la digitalisation de l'éducation, quand même dans d'autres secteurs de la vie nationale. Donc, même ceux qui sont circulés, il y a ce manque de synergie active entre les, les intervenants pour qu'ils puissent euh, avoir donc des, des résultats ou des lignes directrices significatives. Euh, dans ce sens-là, euh, ce n'est pas le, 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 le problème jusqu'à présent de faire des pénétrations de l'électricité euh, ou de, des ordinateurs. Euh, s'il y a la volonté politique et des orientations, euh, et s'il y a, on pourra à, à travailler à synergie avec le ministère de l'Éducation, à travailler à synergie avec les partis ou les, les partenaires financiers pour qu'ils puissent euh, donc, euh, aider. Euh, et on pourrait travailler ensemble pour euh, euh, donc, euh, avancer. 
autre chose que, uh, que je dirais. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Thank you for sharing oui. your thoughts. Oui. Voilà. So, uh, I don't know if somebody wants to address the second question, the one raised by um, Wolfgang. Because I see there is a third question that maybe you can address at the same time. Uh, wondering if any of the speakers have the experience of reducing marginalization. An example, if the ha family has a laptop, they have the father use it and support his son to use it, but possibly the daughter of the house is not prior prioritized to use it. Uh, how do we mitigate for this is the question. Any ideas, suggestions? The Global Campaign for Education aims to relaunch a campaign about uh, really try to address the digital divide and the multiple dimensions that have been discussed today. So it will be wonderful if you can provide some ideas, key messages to be or to inform this campaign. Juliet, go ahead, please. Oh, thanks, Louis. And I'll just, uh, I, I would like to share that the, um, I don't have the practical experience of this uh, approach, but I just, this is just based on uh, what I've read about um, similar challenges that have been experienced uh, in, in cash programming, for instance, where something is provided. So the fundamental principle here is the from the provider of the of the device um, or you know whether it's a, a tablet or a telephone that the the design of the intervention and, and here I'm making the assumption that it, it's coming it's 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 provided to the family it's received by the family as part of a, um, a package of interventions or as a strategy so the provider um, so tackling that exclusion from the from the from the beginning of the of the of the intervention, so um, share providing the information um, to addressing fundamentally. So, what are the needs of um, uh, so clarifying first of all that the that the the purpose of the the lab the tablet that has been provided is is for um, is for the children, right? And and this is why it has been provided. But I, I've also, we, my experience of similar types of interventions has been, and this is just from the, so from the field perspective, is that they, there isn't clarity around that. Uh, and the expectations are, 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 are really crossed due to that. So as much as possible, um, uh, communicating that um, and working with, together with the parents to ensure that their own challenges are accounted for, not necessarily with this particular solution, but there that there, there's there's some thought during the design, some thought has been put into uh, considering what else, you know, what can incentivize their participation and cooperation um, in in this in in this uh, particular uh, approach. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. I see Denise, you want to say something? Go ahead, that, is a, that might have been a legacy hand. Oh. Uh, okay, no. I, I see a question from George Ham, Hamunsunga. Um, so my concern is that embedment in a text by most countries tends to focus on temporal solutions designed to mitigate immediate challenges as opposed to long-term investments that offer durable solutions for future emergencies. So the question could be, what can do we do to ensure that we invest in sustainable solutions that will help us mitigate future emergencies better? Thanks for the question. So um, all of the speakers are invited to address the question if you want. Oh, 
Okay, maybe we all just think about this question, George, uh, for next opportunity to meet you. Um, okay, over to you, Wolfan. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Thank you all for your engagement with this. Yeah, it's of course a bit difficult to do this uh, instead of really sitting face to face and sort of uh, exchange arguments and uh, look at possible solutions. I think what I find interesting uh, is the the, the three um, areas that uh, our colleagues from NFVR had pointed out, uh, including the sort of warning that we should not sort of uh, bet on education technology solutions that become uh, kind of uh, oasis in a in a desert uh, when uh, as is the case in Burundi uh, or in Malawi, uh, children to teacher ratio is immensely high, then uh, edutech might be a solution, but at the same time, uh, it will not, uh, it will not be possible to sort of provide such solutions uh, in, 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 a, in, in a country where uh, connectivity is still a far-fetched dream. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a, a noise <laughs> background here. Uh, I've, I think we have to continue this whole debate uh, what uh, and turn it into a campaign design uh, with uh, some clear advocacy uh, ideas. Uh, and I see, uh, I've been reading the documentation that came out now of the uh, process of in preparation of the Transforming Education Summit, which was going to take place in September this year. There they have identified digital learning as uh, having a transforming potential. Only they say we must have good strategies to better use increasingly and easily available digital learning solutions and tools to transform education in ways that make it more inclusive, more equitable, more effective, more relevant and sustainable. I think it's interesting that the Transforming Education Summit puts digital learning very high on their agenda. And I think we can contribute to that discussion uh, and uh, the points that were made by uh, Rhonda and Hannah in the study will help us to sort of uh, nourish that debate and uh, the same way that our colleagues who are already engaging in pilots uh, around uh, in, in, eight, in seven countries will help us to enrich that whole discussion and debate. So I want to thank you, uh, thank everyone that has contributed to this meeting. That was a great uh, sort of gathering and uh, I think we had a good lot of food for thought. Um, Thank you to GIZ for making their presentation and particularly to help uh, eight sub grantees in Africa and having helped GCE to sort of get this uh, excellent study from Rhonda and Hannah put together. Also to NFER for their pro bono uh, um, peer review that they have done, but I can see that you are very much into the topic uh, according to your own research uh, program. So thank you to you all. Thank you to Martin, Denise and uh, Benedicto. And thank you to the technical team in uh, Johannesburg, Salma and uh, Pilani and others. And also to uh, the global coordinator, Grant. And whom have I forgotten now? Louis, of course. And uh, yeah, I hope to, we will uh, organize another of these seminars a, a little bit along the line we are just uh, discussing with GIZ that we need a little bit of a um, extension of the program so that we can uh, sort of uh, yeah make more room for the other five uh, country studies and also bring on board maybe the um, the discussions that were held at the uh, at the United Nations in via the human 
uh, writes, um, uh, what's it called? The Rapporteur? Yeah, the Rapporteur, because they have also done a study and uh, they are very much uh, is, uh, concerned about the issue of uh, the rights to education and that that is not being sort of, uh, yeah, put into jeopardy by uh, a digitalization that goes uh, out of control and it is not well prepared. Thank you all. And thank you very much on this Africa day. Uh, that was a great uh, sort of gathering of experiences and uh, it has helped us to uh, sort of yeah, get more ideas and prepare for the next steps. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.